Good evening and welcome to your Wednesday, April 17, 2024 edition of the Evening News. I am Jemima Holmes. Thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at some of the lead stories tonight. Five injured as dilapidated structure at Stabrook Market Wharf collapses. Government says systems are working as PPC flags issues with Bellevue Pump Station contract. One dead, another missing following fishing mishap in Atlantic Ocean. Remigrant urges better police response after home burglarized, over 1 million in items stolen, and police army launch month-long Eyes in the Sky operation. Now for the news in detail. Described as a disaster that was inevitable, the dilapidated structure at the Starbrook Market Wharf collapsed this morning, resulting in a number of persons jumping overboard to guarantee their safety. However, as we hear in our lead story tonight, five persons were nonetheless injured. Luan McAllister reports that the Georgetown Mayor and City Council and the central government have pledged to work together to address the situation. <laughs> The destruction on the wharf about the Stabrook Market on Wednesday morning after the dilapidated structure there collapsed. Eyewitnesses recalled that at around 10 hours 15, a loud crackling sound was heard and then seconds later, the old wooden structure came crashing down. While a lot of persons reportedly jumped overboard, a few individuals became trapped beneath the falling wood and zinc. Government officials have announced that five persons were transported to the hospital and are receiving medical treatment for minor injuries. Up to news time, there were no reports of major injuries or fatalities. A large number of persons were occupying the area, even though for years they have been warned and instructed to vacate. In fact, at the wharf, a sign was erected informing persons that the area had been condemned and vendors were not supposed to ply their trade there. But apart from vendors, persons were also living on the wharf. The scene was visited by Minister of Home Affairs Robinson Ben, Minister within the Ministry of Public Works Diodat Indar, Minister of Local Government Sonia Parag, Mayor Alfred Mentor, Opposition Leader Aubrey Northen, and City Councillors. Minister Ben spoke to reporters about the need to ensure further damages are avoided. What we're asking is that the site be isolated, that we work with the city council and the constabulary to secure the site. We've asked that they pay attention to removing the rubble or the debris, the material that is out there, and isolating and making the site safe. The firefighters, and the fireboat will be alongside. I hope the city council will get a bar so that they could start removing the, the, the collapsed material and uh, going forward we'll have to make sure, giving advice to them on consultation, what steps they will take to make sure that the area is safe. Beyond the danger of getting injured walking on the collapsed site as it is, as Minister Indar just said, there's a fire risk. The Georgian Mayor and City Council, in conjunction with the central government, will collaborate to address the situation, according to Mayor Mentor. This situation should have never arisen um, if we had placed the kind of resources uh, to be able to treat with this issue. Um, this thing has been going on for, for many administrations. Under the previous P PPP administration, even the uh, new administration, now again the PPP administration. So these are things that we have to get national um, resources as well as some local resources, either in human capital or whatever, to be able to treat with these issues and, and to bring a solution for it once and for all so that we don't have other persons suffering from, other, from life and limb and is affected in whatever way possible so that we, um, so we have to protect our citizens and protect them in whatever way so to be able to have the kind of solutions moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, spoke about resources. Does the City Council, as it is right now, have the resources to we, engage in this level we, of uh, cleanup? Let, let me be honest with you. The City Council is never a, a broke City Council. We always have resources. It's just that we'll have to, we have resources for other areas. We now have to assign resources from the Council to this area. We, if we have to get more people to be able to treat with, with staff, um, to, to have the, the stuff move, I believe the government themselves said they will assist in a relation to a barge or, or the heavy lifting or, the, or, or from a, a technological standpoint, they will provide that kind of resource. President Dr. Irvin Ali also showed up at the site to assess the situation and interact with the vendors in the area. I think the time has come for a very 
a serious, mature conversation. Robson, I was saying that we are discussing right now in cabinet the issue of key assets within the city that are not being maintained, that are left in a, in a state that is danger, dangerous to the citizens, and we'll have to decide how we address those key assets. As the city is uh, derelict, the, the city is not in a position technically. And, uh, and, 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 and from a management perspective too, you have to be honest, and a leadership perspective. They may, they may need to work closer with, with the councils in a collective way, because from a leadership perspective too, in no capacity to manage some of these key infrastructure and investment in the city. That is why we're discussing, I'm happy to the city engineer, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to manage these key infrastructure. Lamanda McAllister. The evening news. The Public Procurement Commission has flagged several issues regarding the award of a multi-million dollar contract to a new company owned by a social media personality, but Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh says the findings are a testament to the government's efforts at procurement transparency and accountability. In this Gerald Bryan report, we hear that the Finance Minister also committed to having the government take corrective action based on the report. Here are the details. In a statement on Tuesday night, Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh welcomed the Public Procurement Commission's PPPC's report on the Bellevue pump station. The contract for this project, costing $865 million, was in August of last year awarded to the Tepui Group, whose principal is Mikhail Rodriguez, popularly known as the Guyanese Critic. The investigation was launched by the Commission after an official complaint was lodged by an opposition member of Parliament. According to the Finance Minister, the Commission's findings and subsequent report is testament to the government's efforts to reform the procurement system and make it more transparent. The completion of this report by the Public Procurement Commission provides ample evidence that the institutions that we have worked for so many years to establish are in fact operating and functioning and are discharging their extremely important mandates. It would be recalled that the entire architecture requiring open competitive public procurement was established during the previous People's Progressive Party civic government when we, along with our other partners in Parliament, legislated a number of amendments to our constitution which were brought into the constitution in 2001 which included provision for the establishment of a public procurement commission. Minister Singh also committed that the government would act on the recommendations in the report. These recommendations include legislative changes. Meanwhile, the PPC flagged issues relating to the company's lack of experience, having only been registered in 2022, its absence of a bank line of credit, and its failure to submit an audited financial statement. The company also fell short of its bid security requirement. However, the Commission said it could not do anything about the situation since the contract was already signed. Nevertheless, it advised the project be strictly monitored for performance and if the contract is found in breach, that the necessary steps, including termination, be taken. Meanwhile, the Finance Minister has since acknowledged that the government's aggressive development agenda may overstretch the traditional local contractors. A quick perusal of the report suggests that it makes a number of observations that we consider extremely important and it makes a number of recommendations that we consider very useful. And I wish to assure the Guyanese public that these recommendations will engage careful study by our government and by the respective agencies of our government. And where appropriate, will certainly inform uh, future reforms and future actions to be taken, including uh, corrective actions um, in a number of areas where, for example, observations were made regarding consistency between uh, bidding documents and instructions to bidders, etc. Dr. Singh added that one of the government's objectives is to grow the local construction industry so that it can better bear the brunt of the development push. Gerald Bryan, The Evening News. 
The power ship with some 36 megawatts of electricity, which would be connected to Guyana's national grid, will be arriving within 15 days. President Dr. Irfan Ali has since defended the government's move to purchase emergency power to help alleviate blackout woes. Here is Jarl Bryan again with the details. In an interview with the media on Tuesday, President Dr. Irfan Ali made it clear that the government cannot just wish for the Guyana Power & Light, GPL, to be able to meet electricity demand. Instead, a power purchase agreement would have to be signed. According to the President, this is just what the agreement to purchase power from Turkish-based car power ship will do. We said to you that there are a number of problems. One of it is capacity, the exponential growth and the lack of capacity. How do you get capacity? You have to buy capacity. You can't wish that capacity will come and the problem will solve. You have to buy capacity. Whilst the question you should ask, that I will help you to ask, is shouldn't we charge those persons who block the Miles Falls? Otherwise, we would have not needed to buy the one, this, this capacity now. We'll have 165 megawatts available from the Miles Falls to push the power that we need now. But lack of foresight, lack of vision, lack of understanding, lack, lack of planning. And that is what this government is about. Since then, we knew what the demand will be. That is why we said we need the Miles Falls Hydro, 165 megawatts, green energy, powering the future. We didn't get it. President Ali further contended that the former APNU AFC government was only able to maintain effective power due to the investments the previous PPPC government made before leaving office in 2015. Further, he noted that the narrative being pushed seeks to blame the government. He made it clear this would not deter them from doing what needs to be done. We invested while you had the power for the, the, between 2015 and 2020. It is because of the investments we made when we were in government. During that period, the investment was not supported. They did not maintain the investment. They did not add to the investment. As a result, we came back. We inherited what we left. But it's a feasible plan. Of when, course it's feasible. When you, when you look at the figures, we don't know what the of figures course, are. Of course, I'm, trying to I'm saying to you, you, of course it's feasible. I spoke about it. We have a, a, a need now. We have a need. But let me tell you what is the narrative. Let me tell you what is the narrative. Some people would enjoy enjoy us not meeting the demand and enjoy us not buying to demand because you get the free opportunity to go on social media every day we take ownership we take ownership of what we inherited we take ownership of the problem but guess what we take the responsibility of finding the solution and we're going to find solution for every challenge god Mr. bless President. you meanwhile it has since been revealed that the power ship has departed from cuba and will arrive on local shores within 15 days once operational this vessel will inject approximately 36 megawatts of electricity into the national grid offering much needed relief Jarrell o'brien the evening news in a bid to ensure junior teachers grasp their roles and responsibilities within the education sector, the Ministry of Education recently concluded a two-day induction workshop. According to Education Officer Wendy Johnson, equipping junior teachers with the skills necessary for success in the education sector is paramount. Find out more in this Trisha Sobers report. Over 100 teachers who recently graduated from the Cyril Potter College of Education, CPC, and will be working in the 28 primary schools within the Georgetown Education District, participated in the workshop, which was held at the National Center for Educational Resource Development, NSERD, located in Kingston, Georgetown. The initiative, which serves as an orientation for the teachers, provided them with pertinent information on the structures and functions of the education ministry and professional conduct, including appropriate behavior and attire, both within and outside the school environment, among others. Education Officer Wendy Johnson, who assisted in facilitating the workshop, explained that the training is part of efforts to better equip new teachers for the classroom. On this point, she affirmed the ministry's commitment to ongoing training initiatives aimed at empowering educators at all levels of the education hierarchy. While the two days, like I said earlier, not sufficient, we are encouraging them to go to our website. The Ministry of Education has a website where everything that concerns teachers, um, resources for learning that they can implement in their classrooms can be found here. Meanwhile, teachers lauded the ministry for organizing the workshop, which they express helped them understand various 
procedural and activity-based approaches essential for effective teaching as well as adopt tailored teaching practices to help educate diverse students. This program is basically based on um, things we should know and put into practice as a trained teacher now. The way we should perform, the way we should behave, the things we should do, our expectations, um, how we treat our students, how we treat our uh, the parents who approaches us or even the head teacher. Both days were really informative. We learned a lot. We learned um, benefits of the teaching profession. We learned things like um, the hierarchy of Ministry of Education. What stood out to me most was inclusivity in the classroom. Trisha Silvers, Evening News. Coming up, Remigrant urges better police response after home burglarized, over one million in items stolen, and one dead, another missing following fishing mishap in Atlantic Ocean. Do stay with us. More news ahead. Transitions Light Intelligent Lenses. Pick your color. Choose your style. Available at Optique Vision Care. The moment is coming. He has the ball. Will he make the shot? And he made it. Goal! This is the biggest win we've seen in ages. Feel the rush with every bet and win big. Play online at www.ibetgamesui.com. With iBet Supreme, every game is your game. I bet to win with iBet Supreme. Must be 18 years and older to bet. Premier. Premier insurance coverage for less. Stay safe. Bid, performance, retention, advanced mobilization, or customs bonds. Bond with us. Fuel your success. Call 223-0840 or visit premierinsurance.gy. Premier Insurance. Premier Insurance coverage. What flavors does Oreo have around the world? Oreo peanut butter. Let me see. Oreo cajeta. Here comes Oreo Around the World, the promo that takes you on a family trip to taste the Oreo flavors available in Paris, New York, Mexico, or Rome. Register your packages at oreopromo.com. Experience more than award-winning speed. Way more. Get the best that LTE has to offer on Digicel. Officially the fastest mobile network in Guyana. Ookla, the company behind Speedtest, recognizes Digicel as the best mobile network in Guyana. With the best LTE experience and the fastest data speeds, experience it all with Digicel, the award-winning network for everyone, everywhere. Micro, small, medium enterprises can expect significant support in 2024. The sum of $450 million was allocated to the Small Business Development Fund and $331 million for the Small Business Bureau. This will provide for the disbursement of 100 loans and 1,362 grants to businesses. Additionally, 2,800 businesses will receive training in apiculture, farming, livestock, poultry rearing, and micro-enterprise. This and more are initiatives of the 2024 National Budget, which is being supported by revenues earned from oil production. The moment is coming. He has the ball. Will he make the shot? And he made it! Goal! This is the biggest win we've seen in ages! Feel the rush with every bet and win big. 
Play online at www.ibetgamesui.com. With iBet Supreme, every game is your game. I bet to win with iBet Supreme. Must be 18 years and older to bet. What flavors does Oreo have around the world? Oreo peanut butter. Let me see. Oreo cajeta. Here comes Oreo around the world. The promo that takes you on a family trip to taste the Oreo flavors available in Paris, New York, Mexico, or Rome. Register your packages at oreopromo.com. Welcome back. You're watching the Evening News. The Guyana Police Force and the Guyana Defense Force have initiated a joint operation called Eyes in the Sky. Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, President Dr. Irfan Ali, says this operation is another layer of security as his administration works to build a safer Guyana for all. This operation involves the use of drones and members of the public are advised not to be alarmed. Eyes in the Sky will run for one month during which there would be an increased police presence in Georgetown. Roadblocks, stop and search exercises, traffic enforcement operations, roving patrols and raids will be conducted during that time. There will be motorcycle and bicycle campaigns, roadblock operations, cordon and search operations and the execution of warrants. Members of the public are asked to give full support and cooperation to the joint services. We now tell you that while he was out of the jurisdiction, a businessman's home in Burbies was burglarized, resulting in over one million in items being stolen. In this Andrew Carmichael report, we hear that the businessman, a re-migrant, is calling on the police to conduct a better investigation into this crime. Morgan Ramda says his home was burglarized while he was away in China, and because of call restrictions there, he did not learn about the incident until days later. The 68-year-old businessman had left the Sturge Street, South Hampshire Village currently in Burby's home on February 15 after securing it. While in Asia, he received a message stating that someone had broken into his home. On April 13, he arrived in Guyana but did not go to his home, but rather went to the police. I came to back in the morning for the report. I didn't come here. I said I'm going to report it to the police come and open the door. So when the police come, we open the door to take a couple picture and I get some information where the thing um, been, some of the stuff. So they go and they pick up a fridge and carry the police station and it. The person that found the fridge at, that person was in custody or is in custody? No, not in custody. Because I know usually people will be charged for receiving stolen property, so I'm kind of confused as to why she's not in custody. And I guess the police know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I guess so because my brother reported a couple days before I got here. And when I went to Alvin Police Station, they said nobody, no detective didn't come and check something really wrong. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what's wrong, but the Do system... you think the police are doing enough to deal with this, address this crime? Well, I called them twice and they went there, but I don't think it's enough. I think the first place, when they carry the fridge, they're supposed to carry the lady like she up. According to Ramdas, more than $1 million in items were removed from his home. A microwave valued at $85,500, a quantity of hollow block molds valued at $90,000, an electric trimmer valued at $50,000 along with a stove, 60 pairs of footwear, 85 polo t-shirts, 22 dress shirts, a music box, and two dozen plates were on the list of items missing. The list also includes an electric saw and a fan, a stove, four cellular phones, and a quantity of car parts, all totaling more than $1.5 million. Look, I know I can't reach it, whatever the last, they thought more than one point something million dollars. The thief not, don't get that kind of money, because maybe one month they're breaking, another thing already sold. But one lady willing to give a witness that he saw them carrying my fridge across to their house. And did you report that to the police? That no, the you police have a was there. Okay. And it takes the information. So what do you want now? These items are stolen. What are you looking for? I'm looking for them to go to jail. Because so you know the perpetrators? I know them. I know where they live. And are they I know all of them. I know where they, the mother encouraged all these um, things from. What is the position with them? Are they in custody or no? No, they're not in custody as yet. And how do you feel about that? I feel very... Uh, 
very bad because you get take my fridge from that house and you care to the station and didn't care nobody. Ramdas lived in China for 16 years and returned to Guyana some two years ago to open his business. He runs a block making operation as well as other business ventures. The businessman says he's disappointed with the police's response and is calling for more responsible action from the law enforcement officials. Andrew Carmichael, The Evening News. A fishing expedition in the Atlantic Ocean turned deadly, leaving one fisherman dead while his colleague is still missing. Our Burbies correspondent Andrew Carmichael joins us again to report that the men were reported missing some four days ago. Some four days after they were reported missing at sea, the body of a fisherman has been recovered while his colleague remains missing. The two fishermen has been identified as 45-year-old Barat Besundial and 49-year-old Ramdio Samlal, both of the Edward Village West Bank were beasts. The body of Samlal was on Wednesday morning found at the Belgium foreshore. Last Friday afternoon, the two fishermen left a small port at the Edward for sea. They were expected back the following day. After they did not return on Saturday night, a search party was launched on Sunday, but proved futile. As such, missing person reports were subsequently filed at the Blairmont police station. Farmers who were grazing their animals along the beach at Belladrum made the discovery of the decomposed body at about midday on Wednesday. The body was taken to the Bailey's funeral home where his 75-year-old sister, Mohin Hardial, was able to identify the body as being her brother's. I mean, I see so proper, but the people um, who he been buried, the people say he because he wear the same clothes. They say he. And me know him by the bed. If he had big bed, I, I'm out in here in land. And then get all the hair and the arm baby. Sam Lal had been a fisherman for all his adult life. According to his sister, they had not seen each other for more than a year. He said it was another sibling who contacted her on Monday. She tell me that um, that he hear that my book, my book, um, so he drunk, he drunk it. And you went to find out from him, right? Yes, and me go straight, me go and find out. And I say um, that he and the man, the people in the area, that um, they go and fishing and then come back. Sam Lal, who was the captain of the small vessel, has two brothers and five sisters. Meanwhile, his partner, who is missing, had seven brothers and three sisters. All of his brothers are fishermen. According to one of his brothers, he learned of the incident when he returned from sea after spending more than a week. When I come yesterday, what midday time, I reached at 12 o'clock. Then the guys in the wharf were telling me how my brother last when he seemed to be sinking, they both broke up, and then I find him. And start with three days in the Friday, um, to answer now and still deaf on him. And, you know, he's really hurt me and there's, there's my smile, second to last, brother. Tell me about the water out there. And well, now the water is very rough. Just, this is only about nine days now. The water is really rough. Right? And now we got to really be careful. The certain vessel out there. Right? Because if you can't get a proper vessel, you know, it's the minute you're really sinking. The wave will block up the boat. Right? So, I really sorry for my brother. The search for the missing fisherman continues. Andrew Carmichael, The Evening News. As part of its efforts to enforce contractual compliance on public projects, the Guyana government will soon be offering scholarships to state officers to better prepare them to monitor and evaluate works being executed by contractors. Find out more in this Vanu Manikchand report. We have asked the Gold Scholarship administrators to add a particular complement of programs to that scholarship program, a set of uh, scholarships to be offered in the area of contract management, contract monitoring, and contract evaluation. In particular, FIDIC type contracts and 50 current officers within the government structure 
will be offered scholarships. Fifty one time. That was Attorney General and Legal Affairs Minister Anil Nandao, who explained during his weekly program Issues in the News that these 50 scholarship beneficiaries will be selected from various sectors, including lawyers from his ministry, in efforts to enhance government's capacity to monitor, evaluate, and enforce these contract obligations. In recent times, government has been clamping down on delinquent contractors and has moved to enforce project evaluation units at ministries and state agencies to monitor works being executed and hold contractors accountable. Additionally, the Legal Affairs Ministry will also have a contract compliance unit to support these author units to go after errant contractors. However, there have been criticisms that this was just another smokescreen and a waste of taxpayers' money, something which the Attorney General dismissed. He argued that the systems in place were not working and so government had to find new ways to ensure it is getting value for the money being spent on these public projects. You have something is clear and undisputed that it is not working. Is a government not entitled to, to innovate, to make a change in order to get the system to work? Nandlal went on to assure that this initiative will not cost the public purse any additional burden. This initiative ought not to cost the government and the taxpayers a single extra cent. It is not a decision to establish new units, but to make functional units that are already established in these ministries and to refocus them the new unit, which will be established in the Attorney General Chambers, will be manned by existing staff in the Attorney General Chambers. No new staff is going to be hired for this purpose, at least not at this stage. Reporting for the Evening News, Fanu Manak Chand. The right to education provided for in Article 17 of the draft declaration is a policy priority for the government of Guyana. This point was made by Labour Minister Joseph Hamilton as he addressed delegates in Geneva, Switzerland at the opening of the third session of the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. Trisha Sobers reports. Minister of Labor Joseph Hamilton told those gathered at the forum that government is keen on ensuring that this right is respected and promoted and as a result, work will continue to ensure that changing realities do not negatively affect access to and the delivery of quality education in Guyana. On this point, he disclosed that Guyana has already attained universal primary education and aims to attain universal secondary education by 2026. Further, he said the administration's efforts to make tertiary education at the University of Guyana free to all qualified locals is moving apace. Our government has invested significantly, significant resources to these programs which will benefit our youthful population and facilitate the closure of the skills gap in our job market. This commitment is shared through a variety of programs across different sectors aimed at empowering all Guyanese. The Labour Minister added that the Guyana government is investing heavily in programs for all Guyanese, especially those who did not complete their secondary education. Some mentioned programs include the Greater Guyana Initiative, Technical and Vocational Education Training TVET program, and the Guyana Online Academy of Learning Goal, which aims to offer 20,000 tertiary level scholarships by 2025. According to Minister Hamilton, all these programs were conceptualized to develop the local workforce and boost entrepreneurship in order to promote sustainable economic diversification in Guyana. I would like to reiterate the government of Guyana commitment 
towards its transformative development agenda of leaving no one behind with a highly skilled, competitive, and diverse workforce to meet the global demands of a changing world. Trishel Silbers, Evening News. And now for a look at the bridge reports. The Amara Harbor Bridge will be closed to vehicular traffic on Thursday, April 18th, 2024, at 1 hour 30 for a period of one and a half hours. Meanwhile, the Beverage River Bridge is expected to be closed at 12 hours 45 on Thursday, April 18th, 2024, also for a period of one and a half hours. WCPL confirmed for August 21 to 29 and Guyana through to men's quarters, women's semis at Caribbean Championships. Details of these stories coming up in this podcast, sponsored by MacCorp. Complete control of power is in your hands with the ultimate U.S. brand Generac generators from Sylvie's Variety Store. Get the supply and reliability you need every time. From 1,800 to 8,000 watts of power for residential and commercial use. Recoil and electric start with gasoline engines. Generac generators from the authorized dealer's Sylvie's Variety Store. Not a single bar of service. Not with us. Digicel officially has the best mobile coverage in Guyana. Ookla, the company behind Speed Test, recognizes Digicel as the network with the best mobile coverage in Guyana. Be it in Aishalton or in Etteringbang, we got you covered. Digicel, the award-winning network for everyone, everywhere. Did you know Gyro Super 95 Gasoline has an octane rating of 95, the highest rating available in Guyana? This premium fuel is known to enhance the performance of your engine, making it run smoother and more efficiently, leading to better fuel economy and improved performance. Choose Super 95 for more mileage and better overall performance. Guys, I think I'm in love! Wow! Yeah, I was looking at you too. What? What are you talking about? I'm in the tiles. Where did you get them? Oh, me, my decor. Obviously, the best tile store in Guyana. Come, let me take you there. <gasps> my kitchen, my bathroom, my floors. Me, my decor has everything. <gasps> and the prices are great too. So, um, yeah, I want to have a date now. We can build on that. does Oreo have around the world? Oreo peanut butter. Let me see. Oreo cajeta. Here comes Oreo around the world. The promo that takes you on a family trip to taste the Oreo flavors available in Paris, New York, Mexico, or Rome. Register your packages at oreopromo.com.